So I first want to say that I was absolutely inspired by the previous panel, um, as well as feeling extraordinarily old <laughs> and past my sell-by date. Um, and also I want to echo one of the questions. My soul also thrills to the sound of y'all. It's a wonderful <laughs> word. Um, and, and, it, and it really excites me in all the, all the right ways. Um, <laughs> So I'm, I'm very happy to be here today. And I was exceedingly happy last night. I have photographic proof. Um, this is me being carried around one of Buffalo's gay bars. Um, and I was celebrating, and I think we all should have been celebrating. And I want to take a few moments to talk about what happened yesterday, because I think it's relevant to my talk. Here's another one holding this. Uh, you can't really see it, but it says, we do. And it's a celebration of marriage equality in New York. Because I have a confession today. Today, I believe in Yahweh. Yesterday, sixth and largest state to legalize same-sex marriage was New York. And a bill that was defeated two years ago, 38 votes to 24, yesterday passed 33 to 29. And Republican Senator Stephen Salem, who provided the last crucial vote, explained his vote by saying, I have defined doing the right thing as treating all persons with equality. Now, this statement of humanist principles from the New York Senate, 33 years, only 33 years after the assassination of Harvey Milk, is the result of decades of work of millions of people. This result is a testament to the courage of millions of queer people who risked their reputation, their jobs, their families, and in some cases, their lives, and were willing to stand up and state with dignity and pride, I am that I am. These people were of service to humanity. This victory is a testament to the support of millions of right-thinking allies who refuse to allow their friends, colleagues, and loved ones to be denied their equal humanity. People who stood up with courage and a spirit of solidarity to say, we are who we are. These people, including some of you, were of service to humanity. And this victory gives the lie to those who say that there is no such thing as moral progress and demonstrates unequivocally that people, unaided by any supernatural forces, can and will work together to make a better world, a more just world for all humankind. And so it is with great happiness and pride to say today, with you, our only life is this life, our only world is this world, our only hope is each other, and this is enough. Service to humanity, that's what I want to talk about today. And I have a particular perspective on this coming from Britain where everyone is an atheist. I mean, at least you assume that everyone is an atheist when you talk to them, unless they prove otherwise. The effect of religion and power of religion in public life is negligible. I mean, don't get me wrong, we do have a religious right, and she's a very unpleasant woman. That, I have to admit, I stole that joke from Andrew Copson, the chief executive of the British Humanist Association. I loved it so much, I had to use it. Um, but there is hardly any of the power of religion in public life that exists in the United States. So when I came to study um, in Boston four years ago, I was really excited to join humanist and atheist groups. So I signed up to all the email lists and listservs, and this was new to me because, of course, in Britain, all our mail is delivered by owl. <laughs> and if we're in a particular rush, we use the TARDIS. Um, and so I, I signed up to these email lists and listservs, and it was great. I got involved in lots of discussions and debates, and I was having a really good time. And then something terrible happened. This happened. Yes, a small white wooden menorah appeared on Cambridge Common. And the list serves and email lists exploded with life. Unlike anything I had seen before while I had been in the United States, 
The atheists and humanist groups in Boston and Cambridge were outraged by that menorah. They felt it was an attack on their fundamental values, and they started a campaign to eradicate it. And it struck me at that moment that every day, as I walk through that common, I walk past people who live there, whose home that common is. And that this, these discussionists and these atheists and humanist groups had never expressed any concern whatsoever for these people, for these human beings and their plight, people who sleep in plastic bags and on, our, on park benches, but the little white wooden menorah really made us angry. And that started me wondering, what are our priorities as a movement? Now, I don't usually do disclaimers when I talk, but I think that having followed four shining examples of activists for the cause of secularism in public life, it's important to make this disclaimer. It is exceptionally important as part of our platform to protect the separation between church and state. It's critical. And challenging religious privilege and those occasions when religion causes harm is central to any humanist project. At the same time, we must not become so consumed with those issues alone that they squeeze out our humanitarian concerns. And I often wonder, after Menorah Gate, um, <laughs> how much our high-profile lawsuits regarding the Pledge of Allegiance, for example, are costing us in terms of money and other resources, and how much concrete human suffering might be assuaged if those resources were used in a different way. And I go back to Robert Ingersoll, who in this quote did provide the inspiration for my website. We heard a little bit about him earlier. He was known as the great agnostic. He was one of the United States' most famous orators. He was a free thinker in a time when free thinking was much less acceptable than it is today. And he was the person who apparently was heard by more people than any other human being before the invention of the radio. He was enormously famous in his time. And he said this, we are laying the foundations of the grand temple of the future, not the temple of all the gods, but of all the people, wherein with appropriate rites will be celebrated the religion of humanity. We are doing what little we can to hasten the coming of the day when society shall cease producing millionaires and mendicants, gorged indolence and famished industry, truth in rags and superstition robed and crowned. We are looking for the time when the useful shall be the honorable and when reason throned upon the world's brain shall be the king of kings and god of gods. Now, despite the religious language that makes us uncomfortable today, we should resonate to this message, which combines a firm commitment to attacking superstition in all its forms with a commitment to social justice and humanitarian concerns. And everywhere I see a stated commitment to these values. CFI's mission statement says, we maintain that values are properly the subject of study and discussion as much as empirical claims. The Center for Inquiry studies and promotes human values based on a naturalistic outlook. Ron Lindsay express, uh, stressed that in his speech on the first day. And as uh, my friend Alex's t-shirt said on that day, I believe that we, as humanists, as secularists, should be winning at service. But it strikes me that we are not winning at service very much of the time. In fact, I think our priorities often look something like that. We're very, very concerned and exercised about without God. We're slightly less engaged with being good. And what I want to argue today is that we have the capability and the responsibility to shift our focus so it looks a bit more like that. So that service to our fellow human beings come first, with secularism as a necessary foundation for that. And I have more evidence than my personal experience with the menorah that we aren't doing as much as we could in this regard. This book, and I've made a lot of it, is one of the largest sociological studies of religion um, ever performed by Putnam and Campbell. And they showed in a very large series of surveys of serving thousands of Americans representative of the US population, 
that religious individuals give more to charities, both religious and secular charities. They volunteer more of their time to social causes. They are more politically active. They are more likely to vote. And they are more likely to be engaged in their local community. But they also showed, and this is critical, that none of this is due to religious faith. When you um, control for intensity of religious belief, these effects don't show up. In fact, it seems to be due to engagement with a moral community. So an atheist who, for whatever reason, happens to go to church regularly, because they're married to someone who goes to church, for example, shows the same sorts of civic virtues that people who are um, religious and go to church. And an intensely religious person who doesn't go to a church community, for example, um, doesn't show the same sort of civic virtues. And they hypothesize in their book that it might be possible to create morally intense non-religious communities that provide the same basis for social activism and service work that church communities provide religious people, but that sadly they were so few in number that they couldn't empirically test that fact. I think it's our responsibility to make sure they are not few in number, and I think we can do it. A second piece of evidence, and I love this piece of evidence, is the Harry Potter Alliance. Who has heard of the Harry Potter Alliance? Yes, there's a couple of people who've heard of it, but far too few. Harry Potter Alliance is a sort of online activist group that uses the symbols, characters, and narratives of the Harry Potter stories to engage people in civic and service work. So, for example, it has a house cup. You can join one of the four houses, and then when you're doing your service work, you get points for your house, and then they award a house cup at the end of the, of the thing. They um, ask, what would Dumbledore do to frame their service discussions? And they use the plight of the house elves uh, to work against unfair hiring practices. Even they have one campaign which calls Walmart, Waldemart, <laughs> which I thought was particularly good. And they started this organization only in 2009, so it's very young. But already it's been extraordinarily successful. They've donated more than 55,000 books around the world, including 20,000 communities, uh, community centers in the Mississippi Delta, and 4,000 to a village in Rwanda. They called over 3,500 phones in just one day, advocating for marriage equality in partnership with Massachusetts Equality. They raised over $123,000 in just two weeks for partners in health in Haiti, sending five cargo planes full of life-saving supplies to that country. And in comparison, explicitly humanist organizations, in months of raising money for their Haiti pledge, have managed to raise less than half of that, what they raised in two weeks. Now, it strikes me that if the entire humanist and secular community can be beaten by Harry Potter, we have a problem. And it's a problem we have a responsibility to do something about. But also, quite apart from our moral responsibility, there are plenty of concrete benefits that engaging in more social, uh, social and service work have for us. Firstly, it's an opportunity to actualize our values in the world and demonstrate to people that we really are committed in practice to the principles that we espouse all the time in principle. It will help us build a stronger movement, because working together to plan and do service activities builds organizational capacity, brings us closer to each other, and helps us work together better for our other goals. It has a strong emotional component. People will associate humanism and atheism with more positive images, which will aid our credibility. As Joe Nichols said on the first day, empathizing with others will make them more likely to listen to our message. And service is a form of active empathy. We'll be more persuasive if we do this. And we also activate those liking and reciprocation um, scripts that Brian Brushel was talking about. We give something to someone, they're more likely to reciprocate. And it's fun and personally enriching. Service can take us to places we might never go and do things we might never do given our social background, our level of education, our class. So I'm going to give you now nine ideas. I tried to think of a tenth, and I couldn't think of one. So maybe, <laughs> maybe you'll think of one. Nine ideas which are focused around making it easy for your campus groups 
to do more service work and easy for people to come and get involved in that service work. So here they are. The first one is build service into the regular events that you were going to do anyway. This is an example from, this is just a funny image of Darwin. But uh, if you have a Darwin Day party, like who here has Darwin Day parties in their groups? So quite a lot, like more than half of you. If you have that party, why not ask people when they attend the party to bring a toy, clothing they're not going to use, or a box of cereal for a local food bank? Something very simple that everyone can do very easily, no organizational um, skills required, and you just bring them along, collect them all, take a photo, send it off to your local press, and then say, we did something good, and you organize the event anyway. Very, very simple. I think all of us should be doing this. Very, very easy. Second thing to do, reach out to well-established service organizations. When the Humanist Graduate Community decided to do a, a yearly spring break service trip, we started by going to New Orleans to rebuild after the uh, impact of the Katrina hurricane. And we reached out to a social justice organization that existed in the area already, has all the organizational capacity to do this, and all we needed to do was plug in with the program that they already had working, get flights down there, stay in their place. They provided a van and everything, and all the schedules was done by them. And we did our service. And in the process, we met, we met Miss Gwen, whose house we were able to refurbish so that she could move into it after many, many years of being flooded out by Katrina, of having cancer and surviving it, and being subject to contract of fraud. She was able to move into her house again after we worked on it for a little bit of that week. And we found out, too, that she was a humanist, but had never really met anyone with the same values. And so that was kind of astonishing for us. Another principle I think that we should keep in mind is try and do social justice work. What I mean by that is try and do things that take us out of your comfort zone, to go to communities you'd otherwise never go to. This is our second annual service trip that just happened in March, and it was to South Dakota. We went to the poorest community in the United States, a place where unemployment sometimes raises as high as 80%. And we worked on a native reservation with children providing educational activities for them for a week. And again, we met many people, in fact, I think pretty much everyone we met, who had never heard of humanism and never considered atheism as a philosophy that they might commit to. And we were able to be their first introduction to this life stance of philosophy. And it was a positive introduction. We had many people who were very happy to see us there. And it did a lot of good to our organization. Um, another idea that you can do is work with your local community. Many local communities, I love that photo, um, many local communities have service organizations that are already running programs. So when um, we set out to organize a service project to follow the American Humanist Association's conference this year, we reached out to a local green organization, environmental organization, that does these regular bulb exchanges. They have all the bulbs. They've got all the maps of where to go. We just said, we've got however many people. We want to help out. How can we help out? And so we turned up. They gave us all the stuff. We wore our Good Without God t-shirts. And we went around the local community simply exchanging people's old bulbs for new, more energy efficient bulbs and got into lots of valuable conversations about what is humanism, what's it about. I remember one gentleman who stopped me on the street having seen my t-shirt and he said, I just wanted to ask you, don't you think, well, what, what do you mean good without God? Don't you think it can be a bit offensive? And I said to him, what, what about it is offensive? And he said, well, there are some people who think you can't be good without God. And I took a slight moment to reflect on this and thought, well, <laughs> what about that should you find offensive? Like, it seems to me that if there are some people who think you can't be a good person without God, I should be offended. But you shouldn't be offended that there are such people. But I didn't say that. Um, and I think it was wise not to. I merely explained exactly what humanism was, why we were doing what we were doing, the values we were committed to. And eventually, he said, you know, I think it's a good thing you're doing it, and I'm glad you're here. 
And it didn't take, it was a significant organizational effort to a certain degree, but it didn't take a huge amount because we linked up with local organizations that were already doing this work anyway. And we did the second largest single day of bulb exchanges in that organization's history. And that got a press release and more information about our group out there. Um, and it was very good for us, again. Another thing you can do is link up with national service days, particularly like the National Secular Service Day, because it's explicitly secular. Um, it was the brainchild of some students at Harvard after a, another humanist conference a couple of years back. And um, one of the benefits of these is that they often have massive press pushes to get behind it. People know about them. Other examples are things like Earth Day, stuff like that. And they have a set set of principles, which means you don't have to decide what your service is going to do. They often have suggested service projects, and you just look on their website, find out what the suggested projects are, and you can um, simply plug yourself into those. And we've been doing National Secular Service Day for um, the last couple of years. Another idea is link your service to the time of the year or to other big events. So we did a Thanksgiving turkey drive. This is one of the easiest things we did, because the Boston Food Bank already does a turkey drive. You just set up a kind of group name there under the name of your secular atheist organization, and you donate in the name of that organization. At the end, they tally up how much money you have donated under that umbrella, and you get another nice press release out of that. We donated hundreds of turkeys. Um, and it was kind of fun to do that. And we had, of course, very interesting principal discussions about vegetarianism and veganism, whether that was a requirement of humanism, and that was a very interesting discussion too. Uh, so it can spark discussions in your group as well that are worth having. Another example is we just had the AIDS walk that we had a small contingent in. So those sort of big events that you can, again, plug into without m massive effort on your part, making it easy to do more service, to get your name out there, and to promote our naturalistic values. Another great idea, we talked about this a bit yesterday in the Interfaith panel, is to reach out to other campus groups. So when, I love that sign, I swear when I evolve, God loves Magikarp, which I believe is a reference to something called Pokemon, which luckily never crossed the Atlantic, so we never heard about it in England. Um, no, if only that were true. No, I know all about it. It's very embarrassing to say. Gotta catch them all. Um, but <laughs> when Fred Phelps came to protest about the existence of Jewish people at Harvard Hillel, um, we went out in solidarity with them. And again, it was easy for us to do that because they provided a lot of the organizational capacity. We didn't need to decide on what the nature of the service was going to be. And I'm using service in a broad sense here to mean anything that benefits humanity. But the, the nature of the activism was decided by them. They wanted to do this sort of um, uh, absurdist response with these signs that said kind of crazy things. And so we made some of our own and went on and joined in with that. And other campus groups will love you for doing this. If you stand up beside them against bigotry and prejudice, even if it's a Jewish group or a Muslim group, or what have you, then they will like you. And that's, in my mind, a good thing. Um, another thing you can do, and I think this is a great idea. This is the eighth, by the way, in case you're going to, how many goddamn things does he have? Um, you can give humanist service awards. I was extremely proud that the Humanist Chaplaincy was really the first um, reasonably high profile organization to recognize Dan Choi with an award for his work on repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And he came and gave an extraordinarily passionate speech in which he took out the letter that he had been sent when he was discharged from the army and he set it on fire in front of us and burnt it. And I was very moved by that. I was particularly moved because, of course, that's not something you can do twice. <laughs> he had chosen our event as an event which had recognized him for his work to make this very public statement about his feelings, about his, his feeling of betrayal. And it was a very powerful event. We coordinated with the Harvard Gay and Lesbian Caucus. So again, we shared organizational responsibilities with another organization. And it was a great way to get the word out about this service opportunity. We obviously engaged people at the event to go to marches, to letter writing campaigns, and things like this. And one of the fascinating things about this event, and I'm not sure what people think about this, but I think there'll be a lot of time for questions, so you can ask, is that Dan Choi, it turns out, is not a humanist. He's not an atheist. He's a religious person. And we found out about this, and we considered whether that was an issue for us, and we decided that it wasn't. 
because we decided the principles that he was espousing in this instance were sufficiently close to our values and that he hadn't been recognized significantly by many other organizations and that it was worthwhile do, to do it to promote our values. But I'd be interested in hearing what you think about that. And the final idea, as a very simplest thing you can do, is simple fundraising for secular charities. I'm a big fan of the Foundation Beyond Belief. Um, the Foundation Beyond Belief, if people don't know, is an explicitly secular humanist charity, which was established um, to give money to causes that align with humanist goals. And one of the great things about Foundation Beyond Belief is that you can give however much money you want to it a month. I do a small monthly pledge. And then you can decide what percentage of your money goes to each of these different groups that they're giving to that month. So you can decide, do I care about human rights work this month, and therefore I want 50% of my money to go to this thing, or do I care more about um, uh, hunger issues, do I care more about equality, things like this. So they have a whole range of different organizations that they're supporting at any time, and then you can choose the percentage of your gift or your organization's gift that goes to each of these things. So it gives you real control over what you're giving to. And if at any point they come up with a group that you're not willing to support, because I understand that sometimes this happens, um, you can simply say, well, this month I won't give any money to that bucket. I'll put all my money in a different one. And I think that's another great way to do this. So in conclusion, and then I'll take your questions, um, my strongly held belief is that service in the broadest sense of the word, is a humanist responsibility. I almost want to say it's an imperative. And that the world will know us by our deeds. People will come to know who we are and what we value more by what we do than by what we say. And if we continue to promote in our words a set of naturalistic principles and a particular outlook on life, which is not backed up by our deeds, we can rightly be called hypocrites. And I want us not to be hypocrites, because we're better than that. And I think in addition to that, there are clear benefits to us for engaging in service work. An opportunity to promote our values, to build our movement and strengthen our organizational capacity, to engage the emotions of those who might agree with us and those who might not, and to make them more receptive to our message and for our own enjoyment and personal development. So I say to you, I charge you today, go forth and serve humanity. Let's be good without God. I'm willing to take any questions you might have, unless they're mean. In which case, no, I'm kidding. I like the mean questions. Hello, cool. Um, so for me, a lot of the secular people I know, the service work they do isn't necessarily under a sort of secular label, yep. right? Um, do you think that's a problem? Do we need to change that? Is that sort of? So that's a very, very interesting question. I thought about that question a lot before making this presentation. Um, I don't think it's a problem in the sense of the work is going to be good if it is good work, regardless of whether it's under a secular label or not. Um, so I'm certainly not saying to people, stop doing your work with Amnesty International, stop doing your work with Water Aid or whatever it is that you do. I think that there are additional benefits to our movement if we are able to somehow do this work under a secular label. And that may be as simple as engaging in your local, local soup kitchen while wearing a t-shirt that expresses your humanist values. I mean, that's engaging with an institution that is maybe not explicitly secular, but you are explicitly secular while you are doing it. And so I think that's one way to kind of do this, the same things that everyone is doing, um, while um, expressing that this is coming from a particular worldview and philosophy. Um, but I would say, I would go back to that evidence from the American Grace study, which is consistent with a number of other studies that demonstrate that as a rule, people who identify as secular do not do as much as people who identify as religious. 
I think we have to accept that brute fact and say that even if the response to that is, okay, well, I'll do more, but I'll, not do it, I'll still not do it under an explicitly secular label, then that still means we need to do more. And I think that that... I th does that answer your question? It's a good question. Hi, James. I hey. feel you've had your revenge upon me today in the sense of compelling my agreement. I think, <laughs> I think you've brought to equal parts uh, sagacity, pragmatism, and, you know, adorable Britishness. <laughs> That's my secret weapon. For when arguments fail, I have the accent. I, um, I think your service ideas are great. I wanted to maybe um, question trivializing some of the other things that some activists do, like about the... Um, Pledge of Allegiance, um, and I want to suggest that maybe you don't understand there's, there are sort of subtle and, and pervasive damages that those things do. Uh, for example, when we um, fight other battles like church separation of church and state and other issues, a lot of things get thrown back in our face, like this is a Christian country, mm -hmm. and here's how I know, because it says so on my money, and because we have this Pledge of Allegiance. So those are environmental variables that affect how millions and millions of people think about all of these issues. And I would never, you know, say we can only have one or the other, but I don't want to, I don't like to see one trivialized. I'm glad people are fighting the pledge uh, and those uh, similar issues. Okay, I, thank you for that question. I'm glad that someone asked it. I was sure someone would, and I'm glad that it was you. And I also like the word suggestity. That's fantastic. Um, people should use that word more often. Um, I want to go back to my disclaimer, and I want to say it again, right? I want to say exactly what I said. I said, protecting the separation between church and state is critical, as is challenging religious privilege and those occasions when religion causes harm. I said that precisely because I did not wish to trivialize the activism that other people are doing towards these goals. It was not my intent to trivialize it or to demean it in any way. I sought to expressly and explicitly state the importance of such work, while at the same time questioning the, the amount of balance which is engaged in. Now, that's a difficult issue because, of course, by saying that one should refocus some of our priorities to um, cause B, it does mean by implication that we're going to focus, uh, unfocus some of our resources and priorities from cause A. So I, I understand um, if the criticism is we should continue giving as much resources as we do to those issues, um, then uh, I simply disagree. I think that, that currently the movement is slightly unbalanced. And I think that we need to tip the scales. But that I don't disagree in the sense of trivializing the vital importance of those efforts. And I think you're referring to them as environmental variables, as an extremely, um, if I may say so, an extremely intelligent way to view these. As you say, these are pervasive attitudes that are supported by large numbers of, of um, social structures that we need to eat away at at every point. Another thing I would add that I probably should have put into the talk now you asked this question is that I feel our efforts to per, um, pursue our explicitly secular message will be benefited if we rebalance our resources towards service. I actually think that it will not be the case that our efforts to get um, under God out of the Pledge of Allegiance, which we should, uh, will be harmed if we don't focus on that for a little while and spend 10 years doing a lot more service work, right? I actually think that our message will be much better received if we are viewed in public as advocates for humankind, for defenders of equal rights, for people who stand up for the poor and the oppressed. Because I think it's just simply much harder to argue with us if we have that public stance. So I actually think that doing this service work is a long-term strategy towards achieving those secular goals. But I did not mean to trivialize that work and um, I apologize if it seemed that I did. Hi. Um, I'm not currently really part of a student group, um, but I, I'm part of a community group that Ed Beck and I sort of formed it with a bunch of other people uh, called Buffalo Free Thought. And it's more of a, a bunch, it's kind of like a social group. Mm. And one of my biggest problems with it is that we don't do anything. Um, I, I kind of just stopped going for a while because it's just week after week, we just bunch of people hanging out. And I want to get people as excited to do things. I, I want to get people doing service. Um, because when I, whenever I tell anybody about the group, Buffalo, Buffalo Free Thought, Secular Group, they're always like, what do you do? Like, and I, I never have anything to say. 
So what, do you, what is your thoughts on getting people just as excited or wanting to get out and, you know, help do stuff? Um, it's a I, great you know, question. It doesn't seem like some other, I mean, maybe everybody here might be excited to actually go out and do stuff, but it's not always the way. People just, they believe what they believe, but they don't want to, you know, they don't want to do anything. So I love your question. It speaks to something that we're, a new priority that we have at the chapter C that I wish I could talk about explicitly, but I have been banned from doing so. I'm only allowed to talk about it in broad terms. We're about to embark on an investigation of um, humanist and non-religious communities to see what makes them work, what makes the best ones work, and what keeps people coming and keeps them engaged, those sorts of questions. So I'm really engaged with this question right now. Um, I think you have to speak to values. I think that there's no um, accident, that is definitely no accident, but I think it's significant to note, that the word motivation and the word emotion have similar etymological roots. When you speak to people's fundamental values, when you grab them emotionally with some issue that they cannot ignore, they will be motivated to act on it. So I think find an issue in your local area, if it's really locally rooted, that's the best, that really goes to the heart of what it means to be a humanist or a free thinker in that area. Um, and present that. Say, so what? try and make them angry about it. What are we doing about X? I speak like a philosopher. I always do this. I put in, put in these, these um, variables, OK? I'm going to, by the end of the uh, talk, we're going to have all the way X through A and then back again to X of different variables. So start writing down what they are. Um, so what do, what do we think about X? Why aren't we doing anything about it? Here's what we can do and have a, a simple, um, grabby, funny is good plan to do something about it right away. And start small. And then once you've got them engaged in that small thing, we had this presentation about engaging volunteers, and you've achieved something small, and you've taken the group photo where everyone's smiling and everyone's, oh, we did a good thing, we feel good about ourselves. And it's like, well, what's the next thing we can do? So it's difficult to say a specific idea, because I think rooting it in the local community's concerns. Something that's happened recently um, in, so um, just, we didn't do anything about this because it turned out very well, but a sort of incident that really pisses me off that I might do something about is that recently in a um, little kind of grocery store in Harvard, um, a gay couple was thrown out for kissing. It's a little thing, it happens quite frequently, sadly, but, uh, and that may be mad, right? And I know my group well enough to know that it will make a lot of them mad too. So I might take that to them and say, look what happened, send it around an email. This is outrageous. You know, we can't stand for this. Um, I think we actually, it, it speaks to a deeper question of yours because it's partly reclaiming moral language that for very long in the United States has been completely monopolized by the right. So they're the only people who are allowed to talk about values. I think we need to start talking about values. I think we need to start promoting our values. We need to start using those values as a hook to get people engaged. Um, and using a little local event like that may be a good start. But I'm willing to talk about this further if you want. I have a suggestion for the tenth, and that is to donate. Yes. Yeah, organs and tissue um, awareness, uh, and donating your body to science. Just make an awareness day of, of that kind of thing that you can do for service. That's a great one because it's it's got. What's nice about that one, if I may may elaborate on that fantastic idea, is that that does the exact thing of, of hitting a number of key humanist principles right off the bat. So respect for science is right up there if you're going to donate to science. Um, it implicitly rejects supernaturalist notions of what happens after you die, which is one of, the, one of the main reasons why people don't engage in these sorts of donation efforts after they're dead and things like that. Um, it questions uh, issues about ownership of bodies, and it can lead into whole um, choice debates and things like that. So lots of values embedded in that action that can be pulled apart. It can serve as uh, um, material for discussion groups, um, lunch meetings, things like that. Lunch meetings? No, don't talk about that over lunch. Um, yeah, unless you could eat like liver or something and talk about it. That'd be, no, no, don't go there, don't go there. Forget I said anything, rewind the tape. But yeah, that's a fantastic idea. I don't even know if I have my donor card. You could take it bigger, and I think it should be an opt-out rather than an opt-in system. I don't know. I think some states now have an opt-out, so you, it's assumed you'll donate your organs unless you opt out. I think that would be a good thing to campaign on. I think it's a good humanist campaign waiting to happen right there. Hi. Um, hey. 
Um, my student group is definitely interested in uh, doing more service work next year. And I know the panel touched on it a bit, but uh, not quite as much as I would have liked. And I was just interested in hearing your thoughts, um, which you uh, thought to be more beneficial for the atheist cause and for our movement, um, doing work side by side with religious groups or with groups that we disagree with, or putting together our own project. Wow. Um, I think it depends. <laughs> uh, I, I am rather a fan of doing things that are explicitly under your group's umbrella and that you are the initiators of and that you can control the message, frankly. Um, because I think that there are certain risks, I wouldn't say dangers, but there are certain risks when you get involved with other groups, especially explicitly religious groups, that the message that you want to convey, which for me is always um, basically... People who don't believe in God can be good people, and these are the specific values that they espouse. We often forget that bit. Be specific about the values that your event espouses. That can be lost if it, it can become a message of all religions promote these good values, like being nice to your neighbor and the golden rule. And here's an example of that, of people working together towards these goals that all religions share, and aren't all religions good? Um, and I think that there is a risk of that, of our message being lost within the general message, which is, again, why yesterday I stressed the importance of being distinctive and being very forthright about your beliefs, even in an interfaith, con especially in an interfaith context. Um, having said that, I think on some occasions it is very valuable to try and give a leg up to liberal religionists. In some situations, strategic situations, like, again, I go back to the Pride Interfaith Service, I really want to give the liberal religionists a bigger hammer to beat the religious right with. And if my being there is going to give them a bigger hammer, then that's fine. Later on, we can have the discussion about, let's just take your liberal religion one step further and just be liberal. Um, but I think for, for, uh, for specific instances, um, it is very valuable to unite with other groups. Another example is our joint action with Harvard Hillel. In fact, there was many groups, not just the humanist group, but many groups. Um, went out in support of Harvard Hillel. I mean, it helps that the student who organized that was both one of the leaders of the secular group and one of the leaders in Hillel as a secular Jew. Um, but when you, can, when you can be seen to be standing in solidarity with other minority groups, and I want to be very clear for the camera um, that what I mean by this is not you should do this because of the publicity. I mean, strategically, it is wise to, it, well, morally, it is a, it is required for us to stand with those who are oppressed. And strategically, it is wise to be seen to do so. Um, so when you can stand against, for example, anti-Islamic bigotry, if there's hate speech on campus or something like that, or some, someone, you know, sometimes these things occur. And when the humorous group can be one of the first out there condemning it, that's both entirely consistent with our values, and it looks very good. And so those instances, I'd say, be the first in the door to say, I want to support you. Uh, first, I want to say that I really enjoyed your presentation a lot. Uh, I think it's very valuable, and I uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, have, I got a lot of ideas from it. Um, and second, I, I, I reformulated my question like five times, <laughs> changing it very slightly each time uh, as you were talking. But um, basically, under your very broad definition, I think, of service events, um, I almost feel like things like Draw Muhammad Day or Blasphemy Rights Day yeah. fall under the category of service events. And so my question is, uh, which do you think are more important? Um, service events which, uh, I mean, do benefit uh, humanity, I mean, uh, but, but make religious people angry and kind of maybe affect our, uh, our PR negatively, or uh, service events which are, you know, where we can go out and do good and people will recognize that it is a good thing? So I think to talk about... Um, Draw Muhammad Day for a second, because I think that's a very interesting incident, and I think I, I have very conflicting views about it. But I think the issue that I would raise with it is not that it made religious people angry. I have no issue with making any people angry if they are angry simply because we express the fact that we exist and we have certain values that are different to theirs. I'm very convinced that, um, I'm, well, I'm, first, I'm fully committed to fallibilism in the sense that our values are not complete and ultimate in any sense, and they continue to progress. 
and we may well find that we are morally blind to things in 50 years that we, we just don't know about today. I suspect animal rights, certainly trans rights, is going to be one of those things. Um, but um, if stating those values, which I think are the best values that we have going currently for us as a species, I'm willing to say that quite categorically, makes people angry, then screw them, right? We have a right to express our values and to enact them in the world. But I don't think that was the issue that people raised with Jerome Muhammad Day. I think that there was a separate issue, which is in the context of an Islamophobic society, is it, does it do concrete harm to people to engage? Not anger them, but does it make them feel unsafe on their campus? Does it make them feel unwanted? Does it make them feel marginalized? And they're already a group who is marginalized, who's subjected to hate crimes, who um, subjected to employment discrimination. Do we want to do anything that might potentially exacerbate that? I think that was the question. And the thing for me is there are many ways to engage in service that do not involve balancing that problem, right? Where we can simply say, well, you know, giving food to a food bank does not require us to engage in this moral questioning. And so, in many cases, all other things being equal, it seems to me wise to avoid that moral problem, even if we disagree about the solution. Now, I should say that in the case of everyone drama Howard Day, I'm not sure that there is another way to hold that protest and have the same effect. So it may be that in that case, you have to lump it and say, well, we're going to be very explicit about our aims beforehand. We don't intend this to be marginalizing. We understand that some people will feel it to be marginalizing. That's not how we're going to engage in dialogue with Muslim groups as well as doing this. And we are doing this for these specific reasons, which are reflective of these values. And we re respect that there's going to be this problem. Um, I think that that's everything I could say on that topic. Uh, there, there are going to be situations when, in promoting our values, it seems like we're, we're attacking others. And I think we need to be careful about them. If it's merely offending them or making them angry, offend them. Make them angry, if it's necessary. Um, or effective, because sometimes it's not necessary, but very effective, and that's OK. But if it's a case where it might legitimately cause harm to people, um, sort of social harm, the sort of harm I feel when I get a strange look when I'm walking down the street holding hands with another guy, right? That's the sort of harm that I'm talking about when Muslims on campus walk around and feel like, wait, this isn't a place for me because of this expression. Um, that's what I think we need to ask. Are there other ways we can do this? And if not, how can we frame it so as to minimize the possibility of harm? That doesn't mean we shouldn't ever do it. I think we have a responsibility to frame it in that way. I'm sorry that was a long question. Again, I plead, I plead philosopher status. <laughs> Um, so as we kind of like go off into the world and, and do good works, uh, go into schools and teach science to, uh, to inner city kids and all that kind of stuff, um, I expect we're going to face a lot of attrition. Um, we're going to lose a lot of soldiers in our armies. Uh, how do you fight attrition? You know, it's an interesting question. I found the opposite. I found the more that we do this stuff, the more people want to get involved. Because it's my feeling that there is a huge untapped reservoir of people. You know, people often cite this 20% figure of non-religious people. And, you know, we have to be very careful with it because figures different, lots of different surveys. And most of those people still say they believe in God, right? The vast majority of them still say they believe in God. Um, but I think that there is vast reservoirs of untapped people in that area. Um, and I think that those people are precisely the people we might draw into our movement if we were seen as more focused on humanitarian work and less focused exclusively on the question of whether there is a God or not and how that plays out in the public sphere. Because I have certainly had the experience of people, and I've done a number of interviews with members of atheist groups as well as, as part of the research we're engaging with. So this is not merely anecdotal. This is an attempt to discover this um, uh, rigorously. Who have said, I went to my local atheist group and all they ever talked about was how stupid religious people were and how they were superior to them and how all the dangers of religion. And I didn't like that. I didn't want to talk about that all the time. Sometimes I want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about that all the time. And I suspect that there is actually quite a lot of people out there who are like that who might be drawn in precisely by this sort of work. 
So I think that, in fact, we won't have so much a problem of attrition, but we're dealing with how many people we get. But having said that, I think having a wide variety of events with different levels of potential commitment, from bring a box of cereal when you come to Darwin Day anyway, to come on a week-long service trip to South Dakota. Um, it was cool. I saw around Mount Rushmore. It's much smaller than I thought. <laughs> it was neat. Um, but, and, and that place, uh, Where's that place, which you, the, the kind of crazy place that you drive through, and it's all it has is like a dinosaur? Wall drug. That was amazing. Pure Americana. I love this country. Um, but it, I, I felt like an alien. Everyone was looking, who's that person? Where does he come from? His funny voice. Um, but uh, I think that if you do a wide variety of events with a wide, wide variety of commitment levels so people can drop in and out, that helps. So that people say, well, I'm not going to go on the service trip, but I will give 10 bucks to the turkey drive or something like that. So first, I just want to say that you really are really adorably British. Uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you. I practice every day. <laughs> I, I listen to James Bond movies every morning, and I practice the accent in case it goes away. I found myself saying things like schedule or schedule, whichever one is the wrong one. I can't even remember which one is the British one. I'm losing my identity. Uh, but then beyond that, and I should say first that I do know that this is something that you were emphasizing. I just want to re-emphasize it again because I think that uh, my group in particular and the movement as a whole tend to run into a lot of problems with it. Mm. Uh, so like the last time my group tried to do something service related, we ended up having like a five hour long argument between each other about things like, do we really want to support like this service cause that has yeah. religious roots and how should we brand each other or rather how should we how should we brand our service effort and we ended up not actually doing anything besides having a five hour long argument uh, which I think not to point fingers at anyone but I think that's something that a lot of us are really fond of doing yes and I just wanted to reemphasize again that although there are important PR implications of stuff like this like, I think it's really important to just keep in mind that the fundamental reason for doing it isn't self-promotion. It's because it's the right thing to do. And also, I don't really have a question. Sorry, I just... No, I, I'm glad you brought that. And I love it because one of the things I like to say... No, we like talking as a movement. And I think that humanism often gives the impression that the ethical job is done when, once you've discovered what the right values are. So you, you work really hard, you have all these discussions about what you should support in principle, what our values should be, and then you make a nice manifesto, and you send it out, and then you sit back in your armchair and say, job done. <laughs> we know what the right values are. And I think we do have a slight, I parody, but we have a slight tendency to talk a lot more about doing service work than actually do it. And I think that we have to actually do it. And sometimes that means biting the bullet and saying, okay, maybe this isn't the ideal way to frame our thing, but some people are going to eat tonight who otherwise wouldn't eat. And that's kind of is a little bit more important on many scales as to whether we get associated in this one press release with um, you know, the local Unitarian church. I'm done. We talked about this before, but I wonder um, if you can share your experience on this. Uh, when I worked with um, groups in Philadelphia, it seemed that our service projects that involve people actually going out and doing something hands-on tended to draw many more women than mm. men, while our discussion meetings and debates and things tended to draw many more men than women. What's your experience with that? You know, I don't know that I've actually looked specifically to see that, to see that phenomenon. It would be interesting. I think we have a record of everyone who has attended our service National Secular Day of Service? Yeah, National Secular Day of Service and our... Um, I'm just counting. No, um, our, our, this, this event, we definitely have a record of everyone who was there. It would be interesting to investigate this. I think it's perfectly reasonable to say that um, different sorts of events might well draw different levels of women and men, um, and that if you're looking for a way to draw different types of people, not just women and men, but also people of different educational backgrounds, people of different class backgrounds. We're finding very interestingly that the chaplaincy at our Sunday events, we're getting lots of people who don't have the traditional educational background that we would, we would expect from coming to a Harvard event. 
Um, we're getting people from all across the social spectrum. And I think we should try and do that. You know, humanism can't become a movement of, of white male intellectuals. Um, and like me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so it's important to be, be wary of one's own privilege as one lectures everyone else about diversity. Um, but, uh, um, but I suspect that there might be something in that. I don't know the empirical data, so I'm unwilling to make a claim on that front. But I'll look out for it. And when we engage in this exciting, as yet unannounced, large research project that I'm not allowed to talk about, uh, but I'm bursting to talk about, um, I will make it a priority to discover if the groups that engage in more surface work do indeed have a different demographic than those who do not. That is my commitment to you, Deb God. Thank you. As I always say it does. Um, my experience. Any other questions? Is this a question? Oh. <laughs> Let the man speak. Go ahead. Uh, I think they're just finishing up catering, so if you have one more thing, I'll make sure that we can Like, how do you end up having a panel or debate about how we should do service instead of actually ever doing any service? is also kind of really similar to the stereotypical complaint about why we don't attract any women to begin with. Why we don't say again, I miss a lot. About of why the organized secular movement tends to be not very attractive to many women to begin with. I suspect there might be a link there. I mean, to, to, talking broadly, I, it's very interesting to me that the ethical culture movement that is kind of not what it once was, um, but what was one of the most significant secular social, well, difficult to call it secular because um, it calls itself religion, but humanist social movements, naturalistic social movements that ever existed was very much focused on service work. And Felix Adler, who started the Ethical Culture Society, his principle was deed before creed, right? He said that basically what you believe and what you say you believe is secondary to what you do. And he was hugely popular. There are ethical culture societies, actual big buildings which house these societies in many of the major cities in the United States. That's real success for, a, for a, basically a naturalistic ethical movement. Um, and I think we could recapture some of that success again if we slightly shifted our focus. And I think we're going in that direction. I mean, I want to end on a note of hope because it was certainly my feeling at the recent American Human Association conference and hearing the wonderful report backs from many groups here, that there are tons of groups around the country who are engaging in this work, who are finding it fulfilling, who find that it does present their values in a good light, and that it's a great way to spread humanist principles across this country and across the globe. How's that for a last sentence?